Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are here with Professor Anthony Tisley, former Director General of the European Parliamentary Reserve Service, with a vast experience in EU institutions and policymaking, owing to roles in academia at the LSE and Columbia University. Today, the professor was our guest speaker for the School of Economics, International Relations and Diplomacy, CERIT, with a speech about the 2024 European Parliament election and the struggle for top jobs in Europe. It is a great pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, before we delve into our questions, could you please share a brief overview of your thoughts on the upcoming European election and the current socio-political climate in Europe? Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here at, at CERID and at uh, UNINT. Uh, and uh, very kindly, the university asked me at some stage to become part of the um, uh, International Advisory uh, Council, which you have. It's been great to be involved in this new initiative in this way. So uh, I wish you all very well. I think it's very important that we do these kinds of things together, which is we think about the future and we think particularly about the place of Western institutions and Western values in a future which we need to safeguard and defend from our own perspective. The European elections that are coming up in uh, June, very shortly now, in June of 2024, are extremely important at a number of different levels, most basically because they are elections and they're the largest multinational elections in the world. Hundreds of millions of people will have the opportunity of voting simultaneously to try and shape their European future. And we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that. Uh, elections are precious things and democracy is precious. So more than anything else, people should use their vote. However they vote, they should use their vote. But they will also have the opportunity to make a choice about the kind of Europe that they want. And I think the current international uh, political and economic backdrop, which is very serious, is one that makes the point that Europe has a lot to offer. A Europe, in a way, has to step up now to responsibilities which are being thrust upon it. It's not a question of whether we need more European involvement and more European leadership. We definitely need that. We need that in terms of macroeconomics uh, and in terms of uh, internal reform, but we also need it because of the extremely dangerous international context which we now find ourselves in. These are elections which are about Europe's capacity to think about and to defend its own interests in an increasingly hostile world. So if there's a common theme to the elections, not only in member state capitals, but European Union level this year, it's about how and why Europe should act more effectively together. Uh, well, as we said, Europe is approaching the European elections and it does so maybe in a new context, not only because of the war, but also because of the socio-political conditions characterizing the main European powers. And I'm referring mainly to Germany. The economy seems to be slowing down and euro-skeptic parties with AFD, Alternative for Germany, at the forefront are gaining strength. Um, what do you expect for these elections? I mean, before every European election in recent years, so before 2019, before 2014, even before that, in 2009, there's always been the expectation that there would be a push through by right-wing populist forces. I mean, they might be left-wing populist forces, but predominantly right-wing populist forces. So the narrative that we're seeing at the moment before these European elections is not completely novel. And from a journalistic point of view, it's a very simple and easy way of presenting the choice Having said that, clearly, um, a new harder-edged form of uh, right-wing populism is developing across Europe. We've seen to some degree the consequences of that in my own country, the United Kingdom, because it was the kind of uh, the origin in many ways of Brexit. I mean, in the 2014 and before that in the 2009 Euro elections, uh, UKIP, the UK Independence Party, did very well and that framed the debate which led uh, to the Brexit referendum. So I don't underestimate the importance of this. But I would say that I think the EU system is generally very resilient. Uh, I think the fact that the member states of the EU have been cooperating uh, for so long in so many policy areas, on the one hand, and the fact uh, at the same time that so many of the practical problems which uh, European citizens are actually confronting 
can be more easily and better addressed by common collective action at European level means that the logic for uh, a strong and effective Europe remains uh, very clear. And um, each crisis that we've seen during the 20th century has led, in fact, in different ways to more Europe. Um, from 9-11 right the way through now to the Ukraine war, and in between we had the migration crisis, we had the, uh, we had the economic and financial crisis, and so on. We have seen that there is a strong case for a strong, effective, coherent European response. And I'm therefore not pessimistic about the capacity of Europe to address these issues, but it does require clear thinking and also political will. Political will on the part of the leaders not to be afraid of finding European solutions. I think that um, Europe is on the right track. Ursula von der Leyen has been quite an effective uh, president of the European Commission, and the twin digital and climate change agendas helped set the scene right from the start of a transformative Europe that was seeking to step up to the big issues. But in response to the crises which have intervened during the course of her term, both on coronavirus and now on Ukraine, uh, we've seen a level of European action, and I think actually, to be fair, an effectiveness of European action most people would not have expected as quickly and as fully as we saw. So uh, I think, yes, a sense of urgency, but also a quiet confidence that Europe can step up to the plate uh, when it needs to. And uh, 2024 is the biggest election year in history. Indeed, election at national or some national levels will be held in almost 76 countries. And in addition to the um, European election in June, there will be also US presidential elections in November. And in what ways might the results of the US elections affect relations between the USA and Europe? Well, the US election is already affecting relations between the United States and the European Union even before it's happened. Um, and secondly, uh, we know uh, what either a Trump or a Biden administration would look like because it's a very rare election in the United States where you have a current president uh, facing a former president. I mean, I think it's about a century ago since the last such uh, contest. And so it's an unusual election in that sense that we have a sense of what the future might look in the next four years. And I think Europe is to some degree trying to trump-proof it itself in terms of the risks that might apply. We also know that Donald Trump uh, relishes kind of the, sh the theatrical shock and wants to try and use the elections as a platform to scare to some degree people in some cases into action which they wouldn't otherwise have countenanced. And one of the ways in which that is happening already is a greater understanding and some willingness of Europe to step up to the need to provide more coherently and generously for its own defense. Um, Trump is not the only American politician who has made the point over many decades that Europe needs to be better at providing for its defense, but hopefully doing that within a common Western framework of, of NATO. And I think we're making big progress in that regard, must, but must continue to make that progress uh, during the coming months and years, regardless of who is in the White House. It would be as much welcomed by Democrats as it would by uh, Republicans. Henry Kissinger, many decades ago now, I think when he became a national security advisor to Richard Nixon, famously said that the United States had always wanted to Europe or wanted Europe to play a bigger role in its own defense, but had recoiled from the consequences of that. And I think now we've got over that. Uh, I don't think America recoils from the consequences of Europe playing a bigger part on the world stage, particularly in its own security and defense. In Ukraine, has shown us very, very decisively both the need for it and the possibility of doing it, because we are now in a situation of having a very substantial military budget at European Union level, in the way that, say, five years ago, would have seemed utterly inconceivable. And that budget is being deployed in terms of hardware. It's being deployed in terms of materiel, military materiel, which is being used, sadly, in a situation of war. So Europe can do this, but it needs several things simultaneously. It needs to have political will in the form of the actual ability uh, to think through how and why we need to do something and to convince ourselves and others of that. It needs to put resources uh, at the disposal of the European Union in conjunction 
uh, obviously with the member states and NATO, and it has to see that NATO-EU interface as a critically important part. EU and NATO complement each other. EU is better on the soft side, NATO obviously on the harder side. Cyber security, for example, is a very good instance where cooperation between NATO and the EU makes perfect sense from the point of view of both of them. Sanctions and their application, you need the European Union to be able to do this, but it helps in terms of the position and stances which NATO are taking. But also, if we have to have that actual military expenditure and capability at, at European Union level, and we're beginning to see that for the very first time. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And switching the topic, I would like to take advantage of your presence here at Union as a professor to ask you a question regarding the university mission in today's globalized world. And it, it is commonly stated that one of the main challenges is how to educate young people today for the future. Um, what function does education have in this sense? And what do you think about the brain circulation in the globalized world? I think universities have an absolutely critical uh, part to play uh, in the safeguarding and advance of Western values, actually. Um, universities take a lot of flack. They're attacked for being bastions of, uh, of sort of liberalism. I see it rather as they are a, a kind of agora, a kind of marketplace of ideas, and they should relish and develop that aspect rather than encourage any kind of uh, orthodox or uh, kind of conventional thinking. Uh, we need to have uh, a closer uh, interplay between people who are in academia and people who are in the world of practice. I've tried myself, actually, in my own life to act as a kind of bridge and encourage others uh, to, uh, to be bridges between those two worlds so that they don't become increasingly detached and separate. But the fear is that academia becomes increasingly a kind of introspective and overly specialised and that the world of practice is dismissive or insufficiently attentive to what it is that academics can uh, uh, tell them and teach them about what's going on in, in the outside world. So I see these two as working in parallel and we should encourage everything. And I think that the initiative, for example, that you're taking here at Union through Sarah, Sarah and perhaps other uh, 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 initiatives of various kinds to try to build a, a greater mutual understanding is extremely admirable. And I would say from the point of view of anybody who's thinking of taking such a course or is doing such a course, uh, it's a great training, it's a great background from which to go out and become a policy, policy practitioner. And if you don't want to be a policy practitioner, to be an academic who has a, a closer and, and deeper understanding of the real world. So it's very much to be uh, encouraged. Um, we need it more than ever. We need it because the complexity of global issues is, is rising all the time. The interdependency and interpenetration of these different issues is rising all the time. So we need people thinking about these uh, issues as they are and thinking about the future. We need to increase the resilience of our systems by scenarioizing, by trying to play out the points, the risks, the capabilities, the resilience of our systems. Um, and what better place to do it than in an academic setting like uh, like Sarid? Thank you once again, Professor Teasley, for sharing your expertise and insight with us. And before we conclude, would you like to share any final thoughts or recommendation for our audience, particularly those interested in the field of economics, international relations and diplomacy? I would say don't be pessimistic. Um, as you get older, it's characteristic for people to become pessimistic, to become more blasé, to become less enthusiastic about the possibilities of the world, and particularly about the possibilities of government and policy making. Um, I myself have spent most of my career in different ways associated with the policy process, and I think it's an absolutely fascinating way of spending one's professional life. So um, be positive, be optimistic, uh, and don't be um, kind of intimidated or lulled into a kind of pervasive pessimism by all of those people who say we've been here before or things have never been worse or actually um, the crises that we're confronting are so enormous that um, it induces a kind of fatalism uh, and sense of decline. No, absolutely not. Uh, try to engage in the policy process, come forward enthusiastically with ideas for how we can 
save our world and also improve it. And that applies on multiple fronts. Um, I remember when I first was it when I was at university uh, as a postgraduate and was first really beginning to think about policy issues, I was surrounded by people who were talking about the collapse of the post-war consensus, that you know, the whole system uh, was in decline, and that the people who were, who were offering alternatives, positive alternatives, uh, wouldn't really be able to achieve it because it had already been done. Or it, logically, it was impossible. And then we had a, a new wave of optimism and excitement during the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, in which, in many ways, the high point was the collapse of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And there was this tremendous sense of possibility. And that leads me to my second recommendation, which is that the people who come here to Sarid at some point, if they're in the policy world, will find themselves in serious jobs where they can make a difference. Don't assume that there's, any, that there's ever any kind of final victory. You have to keep renewing and improving all the time. Fight complacency. I mean, it's, a, it's the kind of other side of the coin to being optimistic and positive about possibilities. When you find that you are succeeding, don't become complacent about the fact that you have permanently changed the world. The world does not change permanently. Every battle that's won has to be fought for repeatedly. Keep going in defense of those things which you think are important and don't become complacent whenever you find that you've been successful. Those will be my thoughts and words of advice to people as they set out on either an academic or a public policy career in the whole area of international affairs. Thank you very much, Professor. And thank you to all who will listen with interest. And please stay tuned for future events and seminars hosted by Sarit at our university.